Uh, just a quick announcement that I've been secretly streaming for the last couple of months, so if you'd like to come watch or play some games and participate Q&A, I'm streaming on Twitch.tv from Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific, and the link is in the description. Many people who spend time abroad or travel to see parts of the world they haven't seen before almost universally say that their travel experience shaped them into the more mature and cultured person that they are today. In my personal experience, I went to live and study in France for five months after high school, and when I came back, everyone said, Wow, you really have changed. It's like you're so much more social and confident in who you are. But the truth was that for the first time ever, I actually just had something to talk about. Nevertheless, while there can be a bit of a scary learning curve, getting out of your own country to see somewhere new is almost always going to be worth the struggle. And if you're a first-time traveler who's a little nervous, remember that one of the advantages that we have going for us is speaking English natively, which is massively underrated, because English is the only language that is always spoken in airports and in almost all tourist destinations. In contrast, think about it like this. If you're from Italy and only speak Italian, can't really leave. If you're from Japan and only speak Japanese, can't really leave. This is why a lot of European countries like Germany have their kids learn English from a very young age. Regardless, some people will still say, well, if you're visiting Germany, you should still try to learn some German out of courtesy. And while I see their point, that certainly didn't work out so well for Anne Frank. So once you've decided that you're going to travel somewhere, you have to figure out where to go based on who and what you want to do. Uh, what you want to do. And there's really three types of trips you can go on, which are long-term cultural experiences, where you live in a foreign country and start to assimilate into life as a local. There's short-term tourism, where you go see the sights and do the neat things they have that you don't have. And there's the third type of trip, which is capitalizing on the living wage of developing countries to get wasted on the beach at a low price. So once you booked your trip, made it to the airport, and whoever gave you a ride has asked if you have your passport 15 times, all that stands in your way is the airport security. And while it sounded a little terroristy, what I mean to say is that in the United States, going through airport security is the worst. You have to take off your shoes, separate your phone from your laptop, separate your toiletries from your clothes, your liquids from your aerosols, even your books need to be separated from your bag, and all in like 20 seconds. The thing is, when I'm at home, I don't even sort my laundry, so you can imagine I was pretty confused the first few times, but at least I learned what they mean by separate your coloreds from your whites. This is all bearable for everyone though, because really you're just hoping you don't get thrown in Guantanamo for the 110 mils of sunscreen you're smuggling. Meanwhile, if you go through Europe, there's a 60 second line for a handsome Dutch man, who will stamp your passport with his ex-girlfriend's phone number, then offer you a Stroop waffle as he compliments your barrette 50 cal and asks how the wall is coming along. Might have been exaggerating there a little bit, uh, but he was handsome. One of the biggest fears of new travelers is missing their flight, and while that's nearly impossible because they're always delayed, even if you do miss your flight, most airlines are happy to put you on the next flight available. And you might be saying, wait, what if the next flight is already overbooked and has no space? And not to worry because they all already are. And that might make you think, wait, if that's the case, how could I be assured that the airline won't forcefully kick me off a flight that I rightfully bought a ticket for if there's not enough seats? So once you've made it onto the plane and are about to zoom away into the sky, if you're anything like me, one of the first things you'll notice is the women in uniform. I'm not exactly sure why I'm into that. I think because I'm really turned on by employability. Like they say, you want what you can't have. And so every time I'm on a flight and an attractive flight attendant asks if I'd like anything from the menu, I say, oh no, I'm fine, thanks. And then I imagine us traveling the world together. And while I don't expect to ever join the Mile High Club or how that would even happen, let's just say I do always sit in the aisle. And the thing I've been thinking too is that I'm pretty sure you're not even allowed to hook up with someone on a commercial aircraft, especially staff. But I was thinking there's always a chance that like the wings would fall off the plane and we're all going to die anyway, so then why wouldn't you? Even if we survive and there's an officer to arrest me when we land, what you gonna do? Put me in handcuffs? So once you get to where you're going, especially if you haven't traveled internationally before, the first thing you're gonna do is realize you've massively underestimated what the whole thing is gonna cost. Even if you thought you were gonna get a cheap Airbnb and live like a local, suavely haggling the local markets with level 5 Duolingo, the truth is, the moment you walk into the streets and hear a foreign language, fight or flight will kick in and take you straight to the McDonald's touchscreens. Even if you're going somewhere cheap like Mexico, you're gonna get overcharged at local markets and not know where to shop, to the point that by the time you're ready to leave, you'll be as poor as the people who live there. In my opinion, at the end of the day, what you'll really bring back from any trip is a perspective on how other people live throughout the world. 
I actually had an eye-opening experience when I stopped in Northern Africa for a day where you can meet people whose entire family of 15 sleeps in the same room as them, they eat porridge out of fired mud bowls, and they have no clean water or electricity. I had the chance to talk to one lady who said that she made $1.75 a day spinning textiles and her husband made $2 a day farming. And as a person coming from a much more privileged place, this obviously made me feel incredibly guilty for what I had. So of course I reached into my wallet, took out 25 cents, and handed it to the lady in order to close the wage gap. So as a little personal story I thought you guys might like, uh, my most recent travel experience was going to VidCon in Anaheim, California a few months ago, and right from the start when I got on my first flight, the pilot announced, I'm very sorry ladies and gentlemen, but a piece of the aircraft has fallen off, we're gonna have to call our technician to see if we can reattach the piece for liftoff. And I was sitting there thinking, alright, well, it's Air Canada, that makes sense. But the most unsettling part of the whole experience was that the pilot was also so nonchalant about it, as if every second flight a piece of the aircraft is falling off and he doesn't even care because he's just waiting to die. And you know, can't blame him really, but at any rate, the pilot said the technician lived 15 minutes away so he'll be a bit. So an hour later when the guy gets there, the pilot goes over the intercom again and says, mm, Ladies and gentlemen, the technician is currently working on the aircraft, uh, I'll be sure to keep you updated, and we do apologize for the delay. But the part that weirded me out was he was kind of laughing to himself the whole time, and I was getting nervous because it was kind of like a sideshow Bob, you're all going down with me type of thing. It turned out, in fact, he was laughing because the mechanic forgot to bring any tools, so he was trying to reattach a 20,000 horsepower turbine with fucking scotch double-sided. In the end, it all worked out, though, because we got put on a flight five hours later, and I received not only an expired granola bar, but a $5 Tim Hortons voucher that I could use on any purchase $10 and over. But at the very least, I'm happy to say the next plane didn't fall apart and crash us into the fiery pits of hell. We actually landed there quite smoothly. <laughs>